ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Battlefield, Pennsylvania. Today we're on location at Monterey Pass Battlefield Park in Franklin County. In the summer of 1863, the Union Army celebrated its greatest victory at Gettysburg, and Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia once again had to escape back south. At this mountain pass, the rear guard of the Confederates came under attack by pursuing Union cavalry. The resulting battle lasted well into the night and in the middle of a torrential rainstorm. It was a terrible reminder to everyone involved that the Battle of Gettysburg had not been the end of anything and the Civil War was far from over. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. Joining me today to discuss the Battle of Monterey Pass is Monterey Pass Battlefield site historian John Miller and author J.D. Petruzzi. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Thanks, thank Brady. you. John, you know more about this site than anyone else. You've been here more than anyone else. What first brought your attention to Monterey Pass Battlefield Park? Well, what brought my attention to it was um, several years ago, I was asked about local Civil War history when I was down in Emmitsburg, Maryland. I found bits and pieces about this battle that occurred up here on top of the mountain. And just from there, just uncovering more and more information about it, I was more intrigued about what happened here, which ultimately led me to wanting to be more involved with it as far as preserving it, as well as raising awareness about what we would call as Gettysburg's Forgotten Fourth Day. Could you talk a little bit about the size of the park, what we'd see today? Today, the park, the actual size of the park today, is about um, two acres of land with the museum. However, next year, we're opening up 120 acres of property. We're gonna have battlefield trails that will go through, explain the key positions of where General Custer had uh, deployed his brigade at, as well as the Mariah Furnace Road, where there was another Confederate battle line that was forming up just toward dawn of July 5th. And this road here actually has its roots dating back to the colonial days, which makes this more or less a multi-cultural uh, or a multi-use park. J.D., you've written a number of books on the Civil War. Talk about your history with this event. I, very similar to John, I um, have always had a very deep interest in the cavalry. So um, because of that study, one of the things it takes you into are all of those engagements that sort of surround the main Gettysburg battle and the campaign itself, um, as well as a lot of more obscure and unheard and, and unknown engagements during the Civil War. Um, I've always had a, a quite an affinity for George Custer, you know, like a lot of people, and studying those characters that, that make it so interesting um, to, to kind of study the personalities of the people involved. Here we have Judson Kilpatrick, um, on the federal side is the, the federal commander. Um, General Grumble Jones on the Confederate side. Great personalities to, to study, and that's one of the things, I don't know why, but it kind of seems like the, um, the real flamboyant and very interesting characters seem to gravitate towards the cavalry. Engagements such as Monterey Pass and the other, you know, actually more than four dozen other engagements that happened during the Gettysburg Campaign are primarily fought by the cavalry. So, one of the events that you know, I discovered um, back when I was you know, really getting kind of deep into this 25, 30 years ago was Monterey Pass. And as it turns out, and as John well knows, this is the second largest engagement that happens in Pennsylvania um, during the Gettysburg Campaign, you know, let alone the, the Civil War itself. Um, you have several thousand on both sides that are into the main armed combat along with all the support personnel and everybody else involved. A huge engagement. And when we were all looking at this, you know, several decades ago and studying it back when I had a full head of hair, um, <laughs> that kind of gives you an idea. Um, there was really no interpretation up here. No land had been saved, uh, no plaques, no memorials, no monuments. You know, nobody ever came here over the years and gave great speeches, you know, to, to big monuments. And for that reason, we really have to thank John and his board of directors and all his people that have worked so hard to save so much up here so that we can all enjoy it and study it. Now, we know battles don't happen randomly. Uh, follow Civil War battles, you'll find rivers, you'll find railroads. Can we talk about mountain passes like this one and why they're so important? Well, this mountain pass here was very important because of the uniqueness of the mountain um, gap itself. Nowhere on South Mountain do you have several interconnecting roads that anchor onto a toll house. So basically up here on Monterey Pass area, whoever would control the area of the toll house basically would control the flow of traffic, um, whether it be military or goods or anything along those lines. 
for the Confederate Army when they were pulling out or retreating out of Gettysburg because of the way that the road led from Gettysburg to Williamsport with those routes dating back to the Great Wagon Road, it only made sense for Lee to use this super Pennsylvania highway, so to speak. However, it's a narrow mountain pass. Um, with the fighting that took, that took place up here, it just, you, you just don't fight a battle in the middle of the dark in a narrow mountain pass, as well as the torrential rainfalls that occurred during the night, which is what makes this battle truly, truly unique, um, and especially very interesting to me. Now, even though Lee invaded Pennsylvania, seemingly enemy territory, did the Confederates know where all these mountain passes were? Absolutely. Um, we've had some of the first skirmishes uh, in Franklin County that took place um, up here at Monterey Pass as early as June 22nd when uh, detachments of cavalry that were going toward Chambersburg were basically foraging for supplies. Um, the 14th Virginia Cavalry went up against several um, Union militia or 100 daysmen, uh, so to speak, made their way over toward Caledonia, which is basically Cashtown Gap today. Um, a couple days later, you have the uh, skirmish of Fountaindale in which Union Cavalry of Coles, or Coles Cavalry came through the area. And of course, General Buford and his cavalry division came through and they actually saw the, dis, uh, the dust being kicked up in the background in the Cumberland Valley. And just because of the observations made in this area here, um, he knew that there was going to be a major battle that would erupt somewhere in South Central Pennsylvania. J.D., you wrote a book, One Continuous Fight, not just studying Gettysburg, but the campaign around it, right after the battle. What challenges was Robert E. Lee faced with? Oh, um, major challenges beyond um, just what he had suffered in the main battle itself, uh, you know, the number of casualties. He had in his army, and you know, we can, we can sort of debate the numbers um, uh, about how you can actually tally up how large the Army of Northern Virginia was, but if we use a really you know, good accepted number, about 70,000, uh, and then take away from that at least 25% that he suffers at the battle. And his officer corps was really decimated at Gettysburg. In fact, something that he is really gonna have a difficult time recovering from, you know, for the rest of the war. Uh, his casualties are very similar to George Meade's Federal Army, which was larger, but Meade's officer corps didn't suffer as much. So that's one of the, the big challenges that he's going to face Lee, not only for the, the rest of the war itself, but getting good commanders on the ground that are experienced, that are going to be able to command and lead during this retreat, um, which is that, that second major challenge. Now that um, he's decided to retreat from the battlefield of Gettysburg, he needs to figure out exactly how to do it safely and get his men you know, down into uh, what, what, it, what is West Virginia today and parts of Virginia and then across the Potomac. Um, as, as John mentioned, you know, these mountain passes are really a gateway to that safe area around Hagerstown and then on to Williamsport and Falling Waters where, where the crossings are. Everything sort of funnels through these mountain passes. Um, this is back in the day, obviously, 150 years ago, when we don't have large earth moving equipment. We can pretty much put a road wherever we want, you know, today. Back then, a lot of them, as he said, like during colonial times, you know, these were, these were really the highways over the mountains. Many of these roads and mountain passes followed on Indian trails, you know, for instance. And this was all they could use. Coupled with the fact, and here maybe if you want to look at it as sort of that third challenge on top of those first two that, that Robert E. Lee is really facing, is the fact that the weather is absolutely horrendous <laughs> after Gettysburg. Um, on the drive here, we kind of got a bit of a taste of it when the, the skies kind of open and we had thunder and lightning and torrential downpours. Then the roads here you know, were already bad enough when they were dry. And it was raining so hard um, anybody who's ever studied this period after Gettysburg during their retreat can tell you that they read letter after letter and diary after diary of knee-deep mud and the wagons getting stuck and so forth and you have um, thousands and thousands of wounded in, in Lee's army that are just suffering you know in these wagons uh, that have no springs nothing for comfort along these roads um, an enormous challenge you know just trying to get the army moving and the logistics and so forth uh, and then maybe tack on number four challenge is the fact that these rains, which are going to continue for the better part of five days, are making the Potomac swell to unfordable uh, levels. And when Lee then ultimately does get down to the Potomac, he faces that challenge and, and pretty much has to dig in because he's not able to ford for a couple more days. 
Now, Lee doesn't send his whole army through one mountain pass. He splits them up. Could we talk about his decision and what he does? Well, considering that a, a large contingency of wagons were parked at Cashtown or just west of Cashtown, um, he's got the quartermaster stores that belong to Lieutenant General James Longstreet, Lieutenant General A.P. Hill. You have Major General Jeb Stewart's divisional trains that are there. You also have a wagon train of wounded um, that have been collected from the, the first couple of days there at Gettysburg as well as other supplies. In addition, closer to Gettysburg, you also have more wagons. You have um, Major John Harmon's reserve train of the entire Confederate Army there, as well as uh, Lieutenant General Richard Yule. And so when he's looking at the map, it only makes sense to send what was parked or parked in mass at Cashtown. Let him go through, finish going through the western side of the mountain there. Sidestep Chambersburg, basically taking another back road to modern day Marion and then down to Greencastle. And of course, the Valley Turnpike picks up right there at Greencastle. And then you can go right to basically Williamsport. Now for those troops that are Gettysburg, as well as the wagons that are Gettysburg, he'll take the Fairfield Road, sending the wagons first. The infantry falls back into a defensive position. Once the wagons have begun to clear the area, then you're going to go ahead and have um, AP Hill's Corps marching out on the road, followed by Longstreet, and of course, Ruel's Corps will bring up the rear. And it's going to take several days for the Army of Northern Virginia to make its way through the mountain passes. But the bulk of the infantry is going to make its way through here at Monterey Pass. And they will actually use two roads. The first one is Mariah Furnace Road, which is that old wagon road we talked about. You'll have AP Hill followed by Yule there. Longstreet's Corps is going to take basically the modern day routes of Jack's Mountain Road into Fairfield and up through the mountain here. The roads leading to Monterey Pass are basically a muddy mess. However, once you get to the toll gate, they become macadamized, which is like a pavement back then. And from there, it's a pretty easy going going down the mountain. Um, by July 6, sometime in the afternoon around 3, 3.30ish, reports are coming in that the last Confederate soldier has gone through Monterey Pass. However, there's Union infantry as well as another brigade of Union cavalry that's following behind the rear and they're going to skirmish continuously throughout um, the day until finally the concentration of the forces are going to be more or less in the Cumberland Valley. Now, when we think about the Civil War, we think about generals and battlefields, but historians really get excited about logistics. We talked about wagons. Can we talk about the importance of wagons and supplies and moving those wagons with armies in the Civil War? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, and, and it kind of piggybacks on what John was talking about. I think we sort of have to take our mind's eye back 150 years ago and really appreciate, I guess, in order to understand why um, the logistics play out the way they do. And in fact, why you know this battle and so many others plays out the way it does is the wagons um, are obviously very important to carry supplies, carrying wounded, and they're also very heavily laden with a lot of the booty you know, that's taken in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, many of these wagons here in Yule's Corps, in fact, uh, you know, several hundred of them uh, were described later on, and not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but later on when they were checking out what was in these wagons, uh, everything from clothes to all kinds of food, jewelry, you know, things that were, were taken along the way um, before and during the battle. This is how you moved an army. And John Harmon, who, who John had mentioned, uh, another very interesting character himself, was, was given the task you know, by Jones to get these, and I think it was described as about a 17 mile long wagon train, you know, just, just the army supplies alone, another 11 miles for the wagons carrying the wounded you know, through Cashtown Pass. But uh, John Harmon, who was tasked by Jones to get this wagon safely to the river, or as Jones mentioned or said to him, I want to see your face no more if, if you don't get it across the river just had an enormous task, you know, to, to try to do this. Um, he, he was ultimately successful, you know, save for the, the battle and so forth that breaks out here and the ones that he lost. Uh, but an amazing task to do it across those roads in that kind of weather, um, these mountains, anybody that drives through here, uh, you know, just leave Fairfield and take the route up to where we are in a car can be hairy. You know, let alone 150 years ago on a, on a Rocky Mountain road in the middle of the night with a torrential downpour that's just turning the, the road into literally soup. <laughs> and logistics, I think, can really be appreciated when we kind of go back and think about what they had to deal with, um, the technology at the time. And that was the best they could do. When you're a Civil War general, 
you spend a lot of time doing things other than fighting. Do you think the Confederate officers were, were well trained and prepared for that kind of maneuver, moving supplies like that? In this case, it was a very orderly retreat. Um, from what I have read in, in years past, I have not really read anything to where the Confederate Army was completely disorganized. Um, this was a well thought out plan for the most part. Um, it's not like a spur of the moment, we're just going to quickly fall back if something doesn't go right. I mean, as a commander with Lee, he's always has the next several moves in the back of his mind as to, okay, these are the options on my table, what do I do next? And he'll go through all that beginning and pretty much immediately um, in the evening well after Pickett's charge is completely um, decided upon. Um, with logistics as far as these wagons, there's not too many Civil War battles out there where you hear much about the quartermaster wagons or commissary or the ordnance supplies. Um, and it's kind of fascinating because Monterey Pass is just one of those unique areas when you add or count all that into it. I mean, the quartermaster, what is he responsible for? Well, supplies, clothing, um, garrison equipment, tools. Um, the quartermaster is responsible for moving the stuff, whether it's on land or by water. Intermixed with the wagon trains, you have ordnance. What is ordnance? It's ammunition for small arms all the way up to artillery. Um, the leathers that these troops wear, the, the belts as well as the cartridge boxes, um, those are issued out by the ordnance department. But of course, commissary, you know, rations, food supplies. Intermixed in with these wagon trains, you also have several thousand head of livestock. And eventually during the Battle of Monterey Pass, several head of cattle are going to break away from these wagon trains and it's going to be intermixed between Union and Confederate soldiers while they're trying to fight up here in the middle of the night. So now you have another barrier of obstacles um, to navigate through, which is kind of a funny story when you look at that. Um, but even during the battle or even before the battle, Lee, what he took out of Pennsylvania beginning on June 16th when the first Union reports came in, the whole time leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg, he had wagons established at Chambersburg, moving this equipment or supplies down to Winchester, all floating them and bringing those wagons right back up. So a lot of material, agriculture, um, supplies the Confederate Army took out of here, which goes back to what JD was saying about the booty or the bounty that was collected here. And consider, too, you know, the two commanders that Lee puts in charge of those two main arteries of the routes of retreat, you know, that he has to take. Um, on the uh, side of the, um, the Confederate wounded that go down uh, the Cashtown Road through the Cashtown pa Pass and sa south that way, uh, General John M. Bowden, you know, a very um, methodical thinker, uh, a very hard fighter, He's cautious, but not overly cautious to where he's not afraid to fight. Um, and that, you know, is really half of the story of the retreat and a wonderful story in itself. But Imboden was really the right man. And, and he and his men were also fresh, too, uh, because he, along with General William Jones, who's placed uh, basically in command of escorting um, the, the wagons and the troops, the, the main army in this area, um, those troops are really fresh. You know, they, they both come up to the battlefield later and get their assignments, but they're not involved in the main battle at Gettysburg itself. So Imboden and his Northwestern Brigade are, are relatively fresh. fresh. Um, Jones here is really, as Stewart, um, Jeb Stewart, the Confederate Cavalry Commander, once described him the, the best outpost officer in the Army. Jones is basically a master and not only a, a very hard fighter, but um, also very um, methodical in his thinking, um, even though he can be a bit impetuous at times. Uh, however, he always seems to get the upper hand even when he's vastly outnumbered you know, by the enemy. Uh, these are two men that are very, very well suited you know, with this very important task of basically escorting each of them, half of the army, safely down to the river. So I think we have to consider that, that you know, these two men are very, very well placed. And Jones, um, he's a unique character, like what J.D. was saying, but he receives his nickname Grumble because shortly after he was married in the uh, late 1850s, um, he was aboard a ship, and of course the ship had wrecked, and he had witnessed the death of his wife, um, who was swept away. And ever since then, it really affected his mind, it affected his way of thinking, seeing such a tragedy unfold in front of him. 
And from that period on, he more or less just kind of grumbled when he talked. Um, it was a, a it was a something. It was a, a tragedy that would affect him for a lifetime. You mentioned Grumble Jones. Uh, he's a major player in this. Can you talk a little bit more about him and, and if he was the right choice for this job? I think he was a, a really good choice um, for the job here. He looked at the larger picture. Um, he looked at the network of roads because as soon as the uh, Confederate cavalry, and he had an intermix of command. I mean, he had a brigade. However, his full brigade wasn't here. He understood that all the roads had to be picketed. I mean, Monterey Pass, again, you have several roads that connect to the toll house. And again, whoever connect, uh, controls those controls the flow of traffic. Well, connecting Monterey Pass is another area called Fairfield Gap. Um, which is about a mile and a half in, dis in distance. And of course, Jack's Mountain. Any so anything coming out from the east, um, if it would be Union Cavalry, Jones knows that he's got to protect those mountain passes with all cost. And he'll have men stationed all over from Fairfield going all the way over to modern day Rouserville. Um, during the battle, Captain George Emick, who was one of the first commanders here until Jones had taken over, um, he tried stopping the wagon trains, and of course, Jones came, Jones came back and countercommanded the uh, decisions, said, no, let the wagons move. If the Union troopers take, take some, they're going to take a few. So he was always looking at the much larger picture, and I think up here at the Battle of Monterey Pass, with what he had for what he was facing, he did a very well, um, he did a very good job up here in defending this mountain gap. If we were here on July 4th, one day after Gettysburg, you have the wagon trains and the Confederate Army coming toward us. If we were here, what would we have seen that night? That's a good question. Um, I know that a lot of the civilians, um, they didn't like the fact that the Confederate Army was coming through here. Um, some of the descriptions that they had was seeing um, wagons that just kind of appeared at the mountain gap and then all of a sudden Confederate cavalry was a, basically was arresting them and placing them at the Monterey Inn. Um, they were always taking note of what was going on at what times and of course, luckily for what they witnessed, they managed to get messages out to the Union Cavalry, but it's a small community up here, uh, it would later become a resort. Um, but coming down off of the mountain, um, the, the civilians of Browserville today was known as Pikesville, Germantown, as well as Waterloo back then. And all those people just couldn't believe what they were witnessing. They describe a gloominess with a lot of these wagons, especially with the wounded that are in. Um, there's not like a whole lot of ambulances that are coming through Monterey Pass. A lot of the wounded are just thrown into basically um, empty cargo wagons, which have no sh any kinds of shock absorbers. So anytime that a wagon wheel would go over top of a large rock, just a jolt, you would actually start hearing that wounded gentleman in the wagon screaming or begging um, to be let out. Um, as far as that's concerned, it was definitely a warning for what was going to come later on. And, and this area had really been hit, you know, is it, we, we kind of have a tendency, I think, to, to, to look at the Battle of Gettysburg sort of in a vacuum. You know, everybody sees this area of Gettysburg itself, and it's why it's so important to have these areas that we can come out and look at and see the bigger picture. John had mentioned about, you know, some early skirmishes that happened in this area. War had touched, you know, this area during the campaign the week before Gettysburg uh, with the Confederate cavalry that was scouting here. The skirmish that took place in Fairfield Gap about a week before. Um, local militia uh, had skirmished with Virginia cavalry up here. You know, local militia and citizens were trying their best to basically put up roadblocks in these mountain gaps and had also done that at Cashtown. Um, and there were skirmishes that broke out of both places. But um, it's important to study these areas because uh, there was already quite a bit that was happening here because of the importance of these gaps and the importance of the road network. So um, the, you know, by this time, the, the, the citizens had experienced this going on, um, the armies moving through this area prior to the battle. And of course, the battle itself, now the story then is gonna switch over to these mountain gaps and these main arteries that Lee has to use to retreat these folks are gonna find themselves right in the middle of a maelstrom <laughs> of, of all of this. I mean, can you imagine just standing here on one of these roads, um, whether you know in, in the middle of the night or during the day or whatever, in those couple of days following the Battle of Gettysburg, and what you would see, just miles and miles of wagons, wounded, screams, <laughs> thousands of livestock, horses, mules, um, 
officers shouting commands, trying to keep stragglers in line, um, interviewing citizens, you know, those being arrested, like John mentioned, you know, everybody's trying to get information on what the enemy might be doing. They're trying to stay one step ahead of, of uh, the enemy. I mean, just, it would be unbelievable, you know, what would be taking place here uh, just because of the fact that all of this is going to crash like a wave on all these people here and really because of the terrain and the location and where they're, where they're located. And JD kind of touched on a little bit with what the civilians, even before the Battle of Gettysburg and before a lot of these skirmishes were taking place up here, um, the major cities or the major towns in the Cumberland Valley, I mean, they were just nothing more than an, a vast ghost town basically when the Confederate Army comes through because people heard rumors and they all started fleeing to Monterey Pass to where one of the civilians said that the road leading up here to the mountain, especially from the west, it was completely chock full of nothing but refugees leaving out of Waynesboro or in the Maryland areas, which is kind of interesting that when the skirmishes start happening up here before the Battle of Gettysburg and then this major battle that occurs after Gettysburg, um, you know, the people but just must have been scared for their lives. We've spent a lot of time talking about the Confederate side of things. Let's talk about the Union side, the Victoria side. Uh, what's their goal with the, the Confederate Army rolling seemingly in retreat? Well, with Kilpatrick, um, he was given this assignment through Pleasanton, um, Brigadier General Alfred Pleasanton, after they had spotted the movements of wagons moving westward. And he was basically just to go into Emmitsburg, pick up another brigade of reinforcements, and then from there he was to locate what mountain pass the Confederate Army would be using and just harass as much as he can as well as getting into the rear and possibly disrupting their, their line of communications. And by the time he leaves Emmitsburg and he gets up here on the mountain, he kind of brushes off the situation with what some of the civilians are telling him about the layout of the Confederate Army up here. Um, but as he starts going up the narrow defile leading into the mountain, he becomes very worried um, with the peak, a lot of steep ravines. And if the Confederates would ambush him there, of course, he wouldn't uh, be able to reverse a gun to, uh, to defend himself. But really for Kilpatrick, it was to cut that wagon train in half um, once he got fully established. He knew they were coming from somewhere, which in this case was Fairfield Gap or Fairfield itself, so he would send a, a force there. And, and then after that, he knew they were coming off the mountain from some place and headed toward Williamsport. So he would go ahead and just basically, he would try to get from behind, get in front of them, and then just take a brigade of his own cavalry and just cut the wagon train completely in half. And then from there, he would do a lot of damage. So the Union strategy up here, it was a very good one. And to me, you couldn't have had a better person in charge of the Union side. Um, within the brigade, you had Kilpatrick. Um, nicknamed Kilpatrick or Kill Cavalry because of some of his tactics, which, um, let's put it this way, he wasn't afraid to sacrifice his men or his horses um, in order to accomplish whatever that certain mission or objective was. But you also have General George Armstrong Custer, uh, another um, big name in the Union Army, and he just established himself very well during the uh, Pennsylvania campaign from the time he becomes a Brigadier General. Um, I mean, what better two individuals do you have for this job? For, and these guys, they do a lot of damage up here. J.D., could you talk about Judson Kilpatrick, a little sure. bit of his background, why sure. he was chosen? He's one of the reasons why it's so fun to study the Civil War <laughs> and its characters. If you want to get an idea of what he looked like without even looking at a period photograph, all you have to do is look at one of his uh, direct linear descendants, Anderson Cooper, who's a host on CNN. Uh, descended through one of Kilpatrick's daughters. Uh, he's a spitting image of, of his great-great-grandfather, uh, Judson Kilpatrick. As I said, he's one of the reasons why it's so fun to study the Civil War. Um, he was an 1861 graduate of West Point, uh, one of those um, you know, graduates at the beginning of the war when the Federal Army wanted to get those you know, officers out in the field. Um, he is definitely a story unto itself, way beyond all of the things that he gets involved in, you know, during the war and afterwards. Um, before the first year of the war is finished, he had already been imprisoned twice for bribery and corruption, stealing money, you know, uh, actually taking bribes to provide horses for the army, 
He gets in a, uh, a drunken brawl in Washington, D.C. in 1862, and I think that was the second time that he was in prison. But usually he works his way out, and he becomes very familiar very quickly with the, the machinations and political intrigue um, that he can use to basically advance his career. Interestingly, he's actually the first regular federal army, uh, army officer who's injured during the Civil War at the Battle of Big Bethel in 1861. He takes a canister shot to the thigh uh, and, and becomes the first regular army officer injured during the Civil War. So he, he has that distinction. Um, but as I said, before the first uh, year of the war is even finished, he's already been in, t in prison twice. Gets himself out, uh, finally gets into the cavalry because he's been in the artillery and the infantry prior to that, um, a New York cavalry unit, and he becomes its lieutenant colonel. Uh, basically intrigues and does work his way up to the ranks because of his fighting spirit. Um, he does very well at the Battle of Brandy Station, which is kind of the, the official opening of the Gettysburg Campaign in early June of 1863. He is seen by cavalry, the ultimate cavalry corps commander, Alfred Pleasanton, as one of those hard fighters along with your, you know, your George Custers and, and other young officers that are quickly promoted through the ranks. Um, he ends up in command of the 3rd Cavalry Division during the Gettysburg Campaign, and that's, that's how he finds himself in, in command here. Uh, but as John said, he, he early on earns the nickname Kill Cavalry for his wanton use of horses and cavalrymen um, to conduct what a lot of people consider maybe useless charges or impetuous mounted cavalry charges um, at Gettysburg and here during the retreat. One of the backstories, though, and I think this kind of feeds into Kilpatrick's personality, um, and we've been talking about Alfred Pleasanton, the retreat from Gettysburg on the federal side was never really an organized or cohesive effort by either George Meade or the cavalry commander until maybe it was a little bit too late. Um, and that's a little further down the road in the story, but when we're looking at the first couple days in, in the Battle of Monterey Pass and other battles and skirmishes that break out, the Federal Cavalry is really never brought together as one hard-hitting force to put you know, one major hammer blow against the Confederate Army. Um, and Kilpatrick really feeds into that with the, the battle that happens here and other skirmishes because he is not really operating in concert with, with any of the other Federal Cavalry at all and ends up withdrawing here just as he does time and time again, you know, other times during the retreat. Um, and one of the reasons why the Confederates are able to escape here and keep those arteries open to retreat. Um, so we talk about him being the perfect commander, but he's also maybe perfect on the Confederate side too because he doesn't follow up any success <laughs> that he has. Now there's a name we dropped in there, a name that will probably become legendary for different reasons later, but who is George Armstrong Custer here? and before. Before Little Bighorn, who is Custer? Well, Custer, George Armstrong Custer, um, he was a, uh, a young officer. He served more or less along staff officer positions. He's finally promoted to the rank of Brigadier General just on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg. He takes over this uh, uh, command known as the Michigan Cavalry Brigade. And then from there, he'll see his first action more or less before Gettysburg at a place called Hanover, Pennsylvania on June 29th or June 30th. June 30th. June 30th. And then from there, he'll fight at the Battle of Hunterstown, the third day's battle at Gettysburg over at East Cavalry Field. And for a young man who really didn't have the command experience, he is earning, he's earning his own name. And the men are beginning to really respect him for what he is capable of doing. And you see George Custer being that leadership or developing those leadership qualities, especially during the retreat from Gettysburg, um, just like the book that J.D. helped to write, it is one continuous fight. And during that 10 days after Gettysburg, you're going to hear a lot of George Armstrong Custer's name being dropped here and there. And I mean, he's just a, a fine, outstanding young man. And I'm a huge fan of, of Custer for many reasons, but one of those is for what he tried to attempt to do here at Monterey Pass. And he always does lead from the front. And yes. That, and that's really why, you know, as John said, his, his men loved him. Um, they would follow him anywhere, you know, because he, he was a leader from the front. 
at a time when there were many leaders who did not lead from the front, you know, and, and that's one of the many stories of the Gettysburg battle and really the whole Civil War. But um, Custer was one who would, you know, take off in a cavalry charge oftentimes before even his own men were ready, you know, to follow him. But it's one of the reasons why they loved and respected him. Um, and that's what he does here. And, and John, again, is absolutely correct. You know, that's really one of the stories of the retreat and one of the reasons why Custer's name comes up so often is because he is leading from the front in many of the battles and skirmishes that happen over those 10 days. And he definitely leads by example. And that's, uh, to me, that is one of the qualities or a main quality of a leader. Can we talk about what cavalry would have been used for? It's a different breed of soldier, correct? Right. Right. Yeah, it's, early on in the, in the war, the, the Confederate cavalry really had the advantage. Um, a lot of those units came from militia units uh, that were together you know, down in the south. It was more of an agrarian culture. Here in the north, um, you know, there were literally a lot of men who, who just had never been on the back of the horse. And um, the exact opposite in the south. So a lot of the early cavalry companies that were raised in the Confederate Army, these were oftentimes you know, boys, young men, even middle-aged men who had drilled together for years prior to the war. So they were used to each other. A lot of those militia companies then became companies within cavalry regiments um, that were raised in the Confederate Army. Um, they really had the upper hand the first couple years, and especially when leaders, you know, came along like Jeb Stewart um, and, and many others. Um, they had the upper hand in, in battle after battle against the Federal Army. The Federal Army, though, um, uh, cavalry really started coming into its own early on in the Gettysburg campaign when it was finally brought together in the spring of 1863 by then Federal Army Commander Joseph Hooker who finally made a cavalry corps um, a cohesive unit just like the Confederate Army had and instead of them being basically messenger boys and couriers and scouts like they had been before now they were a fighting force you know to be reckoned with performed very well at Brandy Station um, gained a lot of respect from the Confederate cavalry finally by then. And then here during the Gettysburg campaign, they are you know, fighting together as regiments and brigades and divisions. Um, although, as I had mentioned, one of the stories of the retreat is really as a corps itself, not so much, but very much as cohesive regiments and, and, and brigades um, fighting in these battles. So it really began to turn the tables. By the time 1864 comes around, um, it, it is a force to be reckoned with. Um, there's advancements in the weapons with some of the repeating rifles, you know, that come along. And as the, the Confederate cavalry is starting to dwindle down due to losses and so forth, it just becomes a matter of time that the uh, Federal cavalry along, you know, with the infantry and the artillery is able to put the hammer blow on the Confederate army at the, at the end of the war. Now we've met the characters, we've set up the event. Let's talk about the battle. It's nightfall, about 24 hours, a little more after the Battle of Gettysburg. You have a Confederate wagon train moving through a mountain pass, Union cavalry in pursuit. What happens? And that's where this battle becomes very unique. Um, not too many battles are fought at night during a severe thunderstorm. And this is the only battle that's going to be fought on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line by the time it is finished. And it is Pennsylvania's second largest uh, Civil War battle aside from Gettysburg. And it was said earlier, here, right here in Washington Township in Franklin County. The battle begins about 9, 9.30 at night as Kilpatrick is coming up that narrow defile of the Emmitsburg Road to Monterey Pass when he is fired upon by a single artillery piece planted in the middle of the road. Right as soon as that gun fires, several more rounds will be fired out of that gun, and then all of a sudden you're gonna have Confederate cavalry charging this Union cavalry down the mountain a, a good ways before they break it off. And then finally from there, the battle that begins to erupt, it quickly dies down. After Kilpatrick finally reorganizes the attack and the Confederates move back from just the eastern slopes of, of or the eastern um, area here, Monterey Pass, to the actual pass itself, Kilpatrick launches a second assault. And this is where he'll divide his cavalry into three areas, trying to get in front, trying to get the rear of the wagon train at the same time, trying to cut it in half. And the Confederates are going to use the mountainous terrain to their advantage with low numbers. I mean, right now you're looking at less than 100 individuals going up against a mounted force of approximately four to 5,000 who's supported by 16 pieces of rifled artillery. 
Well, luckily for the Confederates, you have supplies that are coming off of these wagons that are going to help to keep their one artillery piece heavily engaged. By 3.30 in the morning, Custer's battle line starts bogging down because of the train. You have a, a small creek called Red Run, which is um, providing an obstacle. Finally, they realize that there's a bridge that spanned the creek that hadn't been destroyed. So the, the Union Cavalry is going to go ahead and charge across this bridge and try to form up to allow the reserves to charge the last Confederate position in which the West Virginians, or the first West Virginia Cavalry, they're going to get a hold of the wagon train uh, supported with like the first Ohio Company A, which was headquarters guard, followed by Custer's Brigade. And about 3.30 in the morning, the people of Waynesboro and the surrounding areas in the Cumberland Valley, they knew exactly where the Union Cavalry was as the wagons are being set on fire. They can follow the, uh, the path of destruction down the mountain. They said it was a 4th of July spectacle that they never would witness again, and they're absolutely correct. No sooner that the Union Cavalry starts breaking through, Confederate infantry is arriving on the battlefield. Um, we have the 1st Battalion North Carolina Sharpshooters, the Provost Guard for Yule's uh, wagon train. They deploy, they're supported by basically a mixed command. Um, some of them are Confederate prisoners. They were arrested for things that they did that they weren't supposed to, but they'll redeem themselves here. You also have portions of uh, another infantry brigade arriving and then Kilpatrick realizing that Confederate infantry coming in from basically the east, he's going to be forced to give up this mountain pass and he's going to continue down the mountain at the same time, you have Custer's brigade as well as parts of Richmond's brigade. They're already fighting in Maryland. And by seven o'clock in the morning on July 5th, Kilpatrick calls a halt to the path of destruction at a place called Ringgold, where he'll take inventory of supplies, the wagons, the prisoners. Um, and then after that, he'll go ahead and move on to Smithsburg and finally to Boonesboro. 1,300 wagon, or excuse me, 1,300 Confederate prisoners are taken. Um, approximately 12 that are killed or wounded up here. However, Kilpatrick's losses, I have upwards to about 100 names, even though he reported 24 casualties. And also, nine miles worth of wagons are destroyed up here um, because of the Union Cavalry. Is it a Union victory? A lot of people say, yeah, if you look at the path of destruction that Kilpatrick caused. But what ultimately happened was the mountain pass was left over, so you can almost argue that the battle is a Confederate victory because of the fact that the Confederate Army is going to use this mountain pass for the next several days for its retreat. Kilpatrick was certainly one to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> <laughs> That's one, one of the stories. I know I kind of sound hard on, but it, but it, really, it really is. Um, you know, as, as John said, it's, it's something that leaves open you know, these so important mountain gaps and main arteries to the Hagerstown area because Kilpatrick doesn't follow up his victory or try to secure these areas, you know, where this fighting happens. I, I just want to mention this, if there, if there was a monument to an individual here um, at Monterey Pass Battlefield, I think it would be Captain George E. Mack <laughs> of the, the, the first uh, Maryland Cavalry, Confederate. He's, he's really quite a story. He's often, you know, uh, called the hero of the Battle of Monterey Pass. Um, John was talking about, you know, the, uh, the less than 100 men that are really defending this lone cannon and kind of fighting a uh, fighting withdrawal um, on both fronts of what happens or, you know, what's the, the main part of the battle here, both at Fairfield Gap and, and Monterey. And they do absolutely amazing work with that one gun and the limited amount of men that they have. Um, of course, the, the terrain and the weather really, really helps, but you're talking about less than those hundred men against several thousand federal cavalry that they are able to hold off. Then later on with the aid of the supporting Confederate troops that come in for several hours. I mean, what a story, you know. Um, that's, that's why people, I think, really need to come up here, uh, look at this wonderful visitor center and, and on all the displays and the wonderful details and everything that's in there to get the story of, of you know, how this really progressed and why it was so important to the campaign. Lee's retreat could have been successful or completely fallen apart here at Monterey Pass had it not been left open for his use. And because of the fact that he had you know, such good men in place, such stalwart fighters like, like your, your Emacs and your, your Jones and so forth, um, and then also the fact that Kilpatrick didn't follow up and really left this area open, just as he would do later on at Smithsburg, 
um, just as he would do, in fact, at Falling Waters with a, a very rash charge uh, down there um, and allow the rest of the tail end of Lee's army escape across the river. Uh, but it's a wonderful story, and it's so important to the campaign, yet very, very little studied. And hopefully that's about to change. And just like J.D. was talking about Captain George Emick, um, we, there's also another important player, and a lot of people are surprised to learn that the Battle of Monterey Pass has a Medal of Honor recipient, right. uh, Major Charles Capehart, who commanded the 1st West Virginia Cavalry. Um, it was his, his regiment that initially broke through the Confederate battle lines. They took out the Confederate artillery piece that was here, and they were the first ones to basically start storming through the wagon train um, that began this backlash of destruction that went all the way down the mountain. He'll finally receive that Medal of Honor in 1898. And there's a lot of small, unknown officers and men that fought up here. But with Monterey Pass, hopefully we can start bringing the Emacs as well as the K-Parts to life and start showing the rest of the world um, some of these true heroes that are in our backyard. Now, John, visitors to this site will be surprised to see a Michigan State historical marker on location. What did the Michiganders do here and why is that marker here? Well, General uh, George Custer, he's the one who commanded the Michigan Cavalry Brigade. The Michigan Cavalry Brigade were the ones that were heavily engaged during this battle from start to finish. Um, they're the ones that got bogged down around the banks of Red Run. The reason we have the Michigan marker here is because the state of Michigan, after hearing our story, they were so overwhelmed by the story, in fact, that they wanted to see a marker be put here, a state-sponsored Department of Natural Resource story here. And we were able to go ahead and unveil that during the 150th. Our sign makes the fifth one of its size outside of the state of Michigan and the second one on South Mountain here alone, with the second one only being 20 miles away down at the battlefields of South Mountain, which was a battle in 1862. This is a battle that's chaotic. It's fought at night, it's fought in the rain. There's gotta be a lot of interesting stories you found in your research. Could you share some with us? There are, and you know, for, for such an obscure and, and unheard action during the Civil War, it was really important to the participants that fought here. Thank goodness they left a lot of accounts. Um, some of my favorites actually deal with the weather and what they had to you know, deal with uh, because the, um, the torrential rain, the lightning, they were really fighting this blind and uh, many of them could barely see you know, on either side. Um, a lot of the soldiers write about only being able to see the enemy or the terrain or anything around them or even as far as their hand could reach when they got a lightning flash. So for that half a second, you know, they could basically see where they were and then maybe the muzzle flashes of the enemy, they, they kind of had an idea where they were. Uh, a lot of them wrote about, you know, slipping and falling. I think there were, you know, probably a lot of injuries happening because of that. But one, one thing that I really thought was interesting, when one of the federal troopers um, and I think he may have been the one who dubbed this Mount Misery because of the, you know, the, the terrain and all that was going on with the rain and, and so forth. He wrote that you know, it was so high up in the mountain pass that it was almost like the clouds and the lightning and everything was down below him. And I sort of got a sense of that um, when my Cindy and I were, were driving here from the York area. So we were coming up the, um, the turnpike and basically following Kit Kilpatrick's route into this fight and um, up the, the Iron Springs Road. I looked off in the distance where I could see South Mountain and I could see Monterey Gaps and, and Fairfield Gap. And it, it actually was as though the clouds were just below the summit of the mountain. It wasn't just mist, but it was, it was literally the clouds that were off in that you know, area. And that's immediately what I thought of. Um, I thought of those, those troopers and what they must have seen and felt that they were so high that the, the weather and the clouds and everything was down below them. So I, I really got a sense of that. And I think um, what they were writing about probably was actually true. Some of my favorite stories is like what JD uh, was talking about. Uh, dark inky or plutonic darkness. One had to be guided by um, senses and no longer by sight. Um, there's a lot of accounts of that. Um, one of the favorite stories of mine is actually by Luther Hopkins who was with the 6th Virginia Cavalry and 
Apparently at one point in time when he arrived on the battlefield, he is in the vicinity where General Grumble Jones is and he's yelling for General Jones. And finally Jones says, you know, you know he says, I'm right here. He says, you know, stop calling me General. He says, call me Bill, you know, and that's because of the pro close proximity that a lot of these guys are in. They don't know where their enemy is. Um, a lot of accounts like that. Um, when the cattle break away from the wagon trains, that's another funny story um, because now you got thunder, lightning, rain. Um, now you have the bellowing of the cow, uh, so to speak. So now you're starting to hear troopers describing the battle becoming very hideous to the extreme. And of course, um, a lot of the stuff that James Kidd, who was a captain in the 6th Michigan Cavalry, um, he wrote several pages um, about the movements here. And he talks about how all the, the gullies are overflowing and streams become uh, just a massive raging river. Um, a lot of the... Um, accounts that are like that, but one of my favorite stories is about the 50 Confederate prisoners that are under arrest by the Provost Guard, and they can hear the sounds of battle in the distance. And Lieutenant Colonel Warden basically says, you know what, guys, if you're willing to pick up the rifle and join our ranks, we'll see that your sentences are lessened. Three of those Confederate soldiers were to be condemned to death. They quickly picked up the rifle and their sentences were uh, lessened to the point that this battle actually saved their lives. Um, and of course, um, the other story, and this is the last story I'll share, is Joseph Leesich with the West Virginians as he is seeing Capehart and General Custer describing or talking about how they're going to do this charge. He said the seconds seemed like minutes and the minutes seemed like hours. And finally, the orders came, let every man draw his saber and he said, like a pack of wild Indians, we charged, tumbling the cannon over the embankment, and then the eye of the prize quickly came upon us, the rear of the wagon train. He says, as they're charging down the mountain, he says, I couldn't tell if we were flying or if we were gliding. <laughs> so that was a, just one of my favorite stories up here. Yeah, I think we have to appreciate the confusion you know, that, that happens here, and that's um, the way it's so often described, and, and why sometimes it can actually be quite a challenge to, to sort of nail down exactly you know, what troops are moving where um, at one particular point in time when we try to sort of piece together all the accounts you know, that we have from the participants here. But there were many officers, for instance, on the Confederate side that ended up getting captured or surrendering who might have otherwise escaped. Mm -hmm. Because number one, they couldn't see, they couldn't tell. You know, a lot of these, and we haven't mentioned this yet, but a lot of the, the um, participants on both sides were wearing those gum blanket, you know, type of raincoats, which uh, disguised their true identity, their uniforms. So a lot of Confederates, thought that maybe some fellow Confederates were actually Federals and vice versa and you know they didn't know exactly who they were fighting but a lot of Confederate um, officers and enlisted men kind of found themselves in a twist and end up getting captured uh, because they blundered into you know federal troops that they didn't know was there. There's, there's also um, another story about uh, quite a number of the 10th Virginia Cavalry who ended up getting captured kind of late on in the fight uh, when they are coming up the road towards the federal position, um, and this is down near, I think, uh, Brown Spring. Um, the 10th Virginia Cavalry is coming up the road and they are suddenly stopped by a federal officer who points his revolver down the road and says, halt, who goes there? One of the men, one of the Virginians says, the 10th Virginia Cavalry. So the federal says to H with you, 10th Virginia Cavalry, surrender. And they had no idea how many they were facing, but they all, just as a group, just surrendered. And here, just a few Federals were able to take, I think, the better part of a uh, battalion of 10th Virginia Cavalry. And they all end up getting captured. So, um, you know, a lot of men just found themselves uh, quite in a twist in a situation that they otherwise couldn't get out of simply because of the, the weather and the darkness. Unbelievable how it's a, an important element of this whole, this whole situation. John, this is a battle that goes over 20 miles, a uh, lot of destruction. Has there been any significant archaeology on the site, or has there been found any remnants from the wagons burning? A lot of the wreckages, or at least the ironware from the wagons, that as they have during the battle, some of the wagons that actually fell off the mountain cliffs and into the steep ravines. Um, a lot of those wagon iron parts were seen as late as the 1930s from a lot of the uh, locality that I talked to here. Um, there are still all kinds of signs of uh, artifacts being pulled out of the ground through these um, what we call uh, special digs or archaeological digs or studies. 
to my surprise, a lot of them are pulled bullets, which are obviously they're coming from the infantry side, uh, the Confederate infantry side, which means when they're loading their guns, they have to have their barrels up and the black powder is failing to ignite because they're just wet. So they have to pull or extract that bullet out and then just throw it on the ground and try to make an attempt to load their gun again. So a lot of artifacts are still in the ground. They're still coming out and there's still a lot of artifacts from the Battle of Monterey Pass or those who were here that are for sale all over the country right now. And we are trying to keep our eye on them and trying to get some of that history pulled back to this area. If we were to come visit this site, what would we find? Well, if you were to come to the site here, um, obviously we want a seamless visitor experience. It doesn't matter if you go to the National Military Park at Gettysburg or a state park there in, in Maryland. We want everybody to come here and experience the same kind of programs, same kind of quality living histories, um, tours. A lot of our tours and programs that we do um, that are concentrated around the battle, they're very heavily attended. They're, we take people for all kinds of tours of the battlefield here, different areas. And you don't have to be a history lover in order to come out here and to appreciate the history that we have here on site. There's a lot of natural resources up here that we also want to promote, as well as other time periods. So there's a little bit of something for everybody. And I think this, when the plan of the park comes together, this is going to be a very enjoyable experience for the hardcore Civil War buff down to the average family that's looking for something to do um, besides going to Gettysburg or trying to get that complete story of the Battle of Gettysburg. And you're going to find a wonderful visitor center here with a, a great collection of artifacts. Um, John has written at least a couple of books on Monterey Pass. Folks who come here, talk to John, you know, talk to his people, take a tour. Uh, they have self-guided audio, uh, auto and walking tours, you know, in, in the visitor center itself. And that's really the best classroom is the, the battlefield itself. So, I mean, that is heartily recommended. Um, get these folks to take you out there and, and explain the action, describe the action. Do it yourself, you know, with the help of the materials that they have in the visitor center. Uh, wonderful experience and one that really should be a model for, for a lot of visitor centers and, you know, the visitor's experience. I mean, this was a grassroots effort by Washington Township with the formation of the Friends of Monterey Pass, Inc., um, as well as the Events Committee, which is more or less becoming more of an institution. And so far, the things that these organizations and the people that volunteer their time, it's amazing what we have gotten accomplished up here within the very little time that we have been together. So it's definitely worth coming up here and, and definitely worth checking out. On that note, I'd like to thank my guests, John Miller and J.D. Petruzzi for being with us today. As always, if you have questions about today's episode or recommendations for future episodes, please visit our website at pcntv.com. For everybody here at Battlefield, Pennsylvania, I'm Brady Price saying so long. Well.